So I have something to confess, and it's quite sad, but in the close to two months that I've had the Canon EOS M5, I took a bunch of photos and videos with it, nothing really professional, but family stuff. We went on a trip and I had lots of sample footage, low light stuff to share with you, but I lost the card. Uh, the sad thing is most likely I'll find it after this review, uh, but I do have to send this camera in, or, um, send it back, and I just cannot seem to find it at my house, in my office, anywhere. So if you're new to the channel and you don't trust my words, um, I totally understand you guys shutting this video off and watching somebody else's review. Uh, but if you've seen my previous videos and you trust me and you know that I'm going to be honest about my opinions and experience with it, keep watching and hopefully you'll enjoy this video. Now, a lot of people think that I'm biased against Canon because of some of the recent reviews that I did and kind of the harsh criticism that I gave to the 5D Mark IV. Now, if this was true, there's no way that I would personally own a Canon EOS M3, the older brother, to the M5 that I'm reviewing here. And in fact, I've actually owned four four of the EOS M1s, the original cameras, and I shot video with those and did some stills as well. So this is our personal kind of uh, lug around family camera. So if we're going to the park, doing something like that, and I don't want to take you know any one of my other seven cameras that I have here at the office, we take this and we do have the adapter with the 518, and it does a pretty good job, especially for the price that I paid for it. So personally, I don't think I'm really biased against Canon. I just want them to improve in a few key areas and a few different things that disappoint point me with their systems. I don't get paid for any of my camera reviews and I don't take money from manufacturers, but if you guys enjoy my content, there's a couple ways you guys can support future content and more detailed, higher quality reviews and hopefully ones that uh, don't have SD cards that go missing like this one. Uh, so if you guys use the links in the video description, we get a few pennies from every dollar and that helps us to make more videos like this one. And you guys can also support us on Patreon where you can spend a few bucks a month and get extra bonuses and perks uh, that make it more kind of worth your while and help out. So thank you guys for everybody that's on Patreon. We do have the EM1 Mark II that we've had for uh, just over a month now, and we're gonna have a really nice detailed review with a lot of sample footage included. No lost SD cards with this camera. So if you guys wanna check that out, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button and enable notifications. So I was actually really excited for this camera when it was announced. Now the marketing material kind of tricked me a little bit into believing that I had five axis in body image stabilization like some of the newer cameras like that OMD M1 Mark II, Panasonic's, the Sony's, but in fact it does not have electronic stabilization built in. Now another thing I was excited for is the focused peaking that it includes. It's missing from all the other Canon DSLR cameras, even the new 5D Mark IV. So it kind of gave me some hope that Canon is starting to step up their game uh, in certain aspects. So the Canon EOS M cameras have always been basically smaller versions of DSLRs. The original EOS M1 that I owned four of were basically T4 eyes in a smaller form factor. This Canon EOS M3 is basically a T6 eye, I believe, inside this body. And this is where it gets a little interesting because this is, the EOS M5 is more like a 80D, so it's a higher class of camera. One big issue with these older EOS mirrorless cameras were the autofocus. Even though they had the same sensors, the autofocusing system was different and it was far behind. The original EOS M basically uh, just did horrible uh, because the, the photo autofocus and the video just wasn't there, almost unusable and super slow and inaccurate. Um, they have improved them over the years and this one isn't too bad, uh, but this guy is finally at the point where it matches up with the ADD. I haven't tested the ADD side by side with this, uh, but from other reviews I've read and watched online, uh, it does super well. In my experience, it's fast and accurate for both photo as well as video autofocus because it does include the dual pixel autofocusing system, which works great. So let's go ahead and start with ergonomics. I really like the body and the design of this camera. It's quite small, it fits in your hand, and even though I have larger hands, the grip is still decent size. I mean, I would probably like to see it slightly wider to allow a little bit more room, uh, especially if you're gonna use an adapter with adapted lenses, uh, but it's really not bad, and I do like the dial layout. On the back, we have our exposure compensation, we have a shutter button up front, 
Now, one button I absolutely love is this center function dial with the button. You click on the button, and as you click, it scrolls through white balance, aperture, and ISO. So it's very fast and convenient to be able to change what that does depending on your needs, and then use that to adjust it. So if you're in a low light situation with changing lighting, uh, you have your other settings locked in and manual, and I can quickly just change through my ISOs. Uh, or if you're going from inside and outside, it can change through white balances or aperture. I think it's very, very convenient and I do like it. Um, overall, it's just the whole camera, the, the layout and the buttons feel nice. We have this new flip down screen design. I'll open that up right there. And this is uh, maybe a love it or hate it depending on your, uh, your setup. Of course, this older M3, it has a flip up screen design. So that allows you to do uh, take selfie photos, uh, video, and to see yourself and still use a tripod. And if you're on a tripod, you're not blocking this screen. Uh, where on this camera, if you're using a tripod, you are gonna be blocking the screen. So it really depends on your setup. Now, if you like to do vlogging, you can have a shotgun mic up here and not block the screen if you're doing handheld. So that is nice. Whereas this you can use on a tripod and not block the screen. But if you have a shotgun mic up here, you're gonna be blocking the screen. So it's kind of what works best for you. Of course, on this camera here, you have this EVF, uh, which blocks the screen from being able to flip up, at least with this hinge system. On other cameras, like the Panasonic's and the Olympus's, you kind of have the best of both worlds. You have a side one, uh, which sometimes isn't great if you're vlogging and you're looking off to the side, but it's great for framing, being able to see yourself, flipping it back, and then also closing if you wanna protect the screen from getting damaged. And then if you're using a tripod, or a shock and mic or both at the same time, you could still use the screen to see yourself uh, when framing your video. So that's a good thing. Now there are a couple more drawbacks from uh, this body design overall and having the EVF. Now the flash up here, you press it and it pops up like this giving you a standard DSLR type direct flash with, which looks really bad and I really never use. The good thing about the older system like the EOS M3 and like the A6500 is you have this style of flash which allows you to just pull up on your finger and bounce it off of the ceiling giving much better results uh, for photos. Now another big downside I found with this system is if you're going to use a standard Manfrotto type of plate, which pretty much most videographers use and some photographers use as well, you're going to block this slot. So it's quite long and they could have designed it maybe a, a quarter inch or a half inch shorter and still kept the same battery size because the battery doesn't take up that whole space and then it'd be able to open uh, with the Manfrotto plate. But this way we have a plate on there. You're not going to be able to get to your SD card or your battery. Now, one thing that Canon always gets right is their displays. This display on the back of the screen is much nicer than the Sony A63, A6500, and even nicer than something like a $3,200 A7R2 or like an A7S2. It's nice and bright, it's crisp, and it just looks really good, and it's easy to manual focus video and see what's in focus. So even though this camera does have focus peaking, it's not really needed because you can easily tell what's in focus on the rear of the screen. On top of that, the menu system is laid out very nicely. It's easy to learn and figure out what's where and remember those things where it takes much, much longer on the Sony systems. The touchscreen also works very well. It's very easy to touch on what you want to focus or change different menu settings. It's very responsive and uh, it's just laid out really well, better than uh, most other camera systems. Now let's move on to the biggest shocker with this camera when I took it out of the box, and that's the build quality, and in specifically the materials. I've owned this camera for at least six months now, probably longer. I've owned the EOS M1s, and I've used tons of different cameras, cheap cameras, expensive cameras, and this has by far got to be the cheapest build as far as the plastic that they're using. Uh, this camera, even though it was $800 when it came out, and I bought it for 450 to 500 new, uh, this one's 1100 and it feels really bad. You instantly can tell. Um, this, this feels like thin, cheap plastic everywhere and the rubber doesn't feel great either. The slot at the bottom here, it feels so flimsy and thin that it could easily break off and this whole bottom plate just feels super thin, super cheap. Like if I tighten down the tripod, even though this, it does have a metal inlay that it could just crack or break or if I drop it, a chunk is just gonna go missing. I've actually dropped this one on the corner uh, let's see here, back here, and it just put a couple scratches in it. That was all. 
uh, but this thing feels so solid. It almost feels like uh, metal coated with plastic like they do on some of the more expensive bodies. Where this thing, I mean, if I drop this, I'm pretty confident it would just take a chunk out uh, of the camera. And this is really disappointing because this thing's $1,100. It's their highest end camera. And for some reason, they went down on the materials, probably to save money or maybe for some other reason. But it just feels really cheap. Now, on top of that, they have this new kit lens that closes and uh, you pull up on this slot, you close it. So it's a little bit more compact than this one. Uh, not a huge difference, but there is some. But they don't include a lens hood like they used to, which is uh, kind of weird that they don't. Uh, but it also feels like really cheap plastic. Whereas this, it might be metal. And if it's not metal, that's impressive because it feels really metallic and higher build quality. And on this kit lens, which this lens was included with all the previous M cameras, uh, you see a nice metal mount. Now, take a look at this kit lens. Now they switch to a plastic mount. And weight-wise, there's not a big difference. So I don't think it's for weight savings. I think it's just for cost savings. And I've actually compared both of these two lenses, and this one is actually uh, sharper. Even though it's not as wide, this is an 18 to 55 compared to a 15 to 45, it is noticeably sharper when you take side-by-side -side images. So that is definitely a disappointment that they're going down that route uh, instead of sticking to a good quality um, you know, materials and system that they're using. Moving on to photos, the photo quality is quite good. It's basically the same as the Canon 80D. So if you wanna see sample photos, you can just search up online. There's gonna be a lot more examples compared to if you just look up M5. The autofocus is nice and fast. It tracks fast, it's accurate. So that's definitely a good thing. And uh, for video, you do have the dual pixel autofocus. Now, the sensor in here is Canon's latest, like I said, in the 80D. And it is probably not as good, but it's close to as good as the latest Sony and Nikon and um, Fuji sensors. The low light has improved a lot. The dynamic range has improved a lot over their previous APS-C sensors. So it's not going to beat those out, but it's not no longer going to be like a downside to owning a Canon camera that your image quality is noticeably worse uh, than some of the other brands. As far as photo autofocusing, we did do tests compared to the G85, the A6500, and also the M3, and it was noticeably faster and more accurate than the M3, but the G85 and the A6500 still beat it out. For moving subjects and tracking autofocus, it was also better than the M3 at about 80% accuracy to about 60%. So overall, if you pick up this camera, photo quality and autofocus accuracy is not going to be any of your issues. As far as video quality, it really is quite poor and disappointing. It is 1080p, but honestly, to my eyes, it looks more like 720p upscaled. Now, along with that, uh, it also has some weird image issues. Like I noticed banding in one video that we shot, and typically you'd get banding if you're really trying to push an 8-bit file for grading, or maybe if there's a gradation in your image and you upload to YouTube and they really compress it. But this banding was before any of that happened, just a standard, uh, normal picture profile image, and it was showing banding. So I really don't know what's going on, and the bitrate isn't like it's low, uh, so it must have something to do with processing. Now, typically when I get a camera in for review, I'll use it a little bit, and if it's a good camera, I'll actually use it for some paid work. Uh, with this camera, I did not use it for any paid work, and even the family stuff that I shot, I honestly felt like I was uh, missing out on those memories as far as the quality, just seeing the image afterwards, especially on the, we took a trip over to Olympia to indoor water park. Uh, I really wish I could share those with you guys, but afterwards looking at the computer, it just looked horrible. I, I felt like I wasted my time. And honestly, I rather use my iPhone to shoot video. Uh, you guys will see a side by side using the 4, 4K on the iPhone, 1080 on the iPhone, and then this, then using this camera. Um, of course, this is going to be better in like low light, but it just, it doesn't look very good. For an upside, the video autofocusing works really well like other Canon cameras that have the dual pixel autofocusing. It's really easy to touch on the screen and choose what you want to focus or track, or just leaving it in auto. It does a really good job at uh, figuring out what needs to be focused on and tracking it, so that is a benefit. It does have focus speaking, but like I mentioned, you don't really need to use that because the screen is nice and bright and sharp, so if you're manual focusing, it's fairly easy, but leaving it in auto, it'll do a decent job. Even though the sensor has good dynamic range, in the video mode, it doesn't really translate. So if you're used to a Panasonic or uh, a Sony, the Sony really just kills it in dynamic range, even if you're not using S-Log. 
So far, I haven't even mentioned 4K, and honestly, this is the first camera that I've reviewed that doesn't have 4K video in at least two and a half years. I was just really interested in it, but even forgetting 4K, forgetting 1080p at 120fps, forgetting S-Log uh, or just ROG log recording, um, forgetting IBIS, even just looking at the 1080p and forgetting all those other things that other cameras offer, it really isn't good for video. Now on a positive note, uh, the preamps that are built in for the mic input are not great, but they're decent. They're probably about average. Whereas previous Canon cameras, uh, they were really quite poor and you had to either feed it a very, very hot signal or use an external recorder, which is what I typically would do. So that's a good improvement. Now, before we move on to the most important, kind of biggest disappointment about this camera, did you guys notice that edge light? Sorry guys, it was off. Hopefully that makes the image look better. I think it should, right? What do you guys think? So the worst part about this camera isn't really about this camera. It's about these things right here. Now, if you count the M6 that they just announced um, after the release of this camera, that makes it five cameras that they've put out. You have the M1, the M2, which didn't come to the States, the M3, for some reason they skipped the M4, uh, then they went straight to the M5 and then the M6. They only have five aftermarket lenses. So if you don't count the kit lens, they have five other lenses. Uh, I don't know of any other company that put out five new bodies without putting out more than five cameras. Um, so very interesting. Now, as far as lenses, they have uh, two prime lenses and three kind of slow zoom lenses. Now the first lens is a 28 millimeter f3.5 macro lens. And it's an interesting lens because it actually has a ring light built into it. So that's pretty cool. The next prime lens is a 22 f2. Now I really like this lens and I had one when I had my previous M1 cameras and doing this review kind of reminds me I need to buy another one of those because it's a really sweet lens because of how small it is. It's a pancake lens. It's literally like less than half of this kit lens with it being closed. So very small, it's actually very sharp as well. And with a equivalent of about 35 millimeters, it's very usable. So that's an excellent lens. And I really wish that I had one, where's my Sony, uh, instead of this lens. So nice and small, nice and sharp. This is a 20 F2.8 and I would love a 22 F2. That's perfect. Now, and, and if you don't count those prime lenses, they have three zooms, an ultra wide zoom, uh, kind of medium standard zoom, and then they have a telephoto zoom, each lens being f3.5 all the way up to like f6.3. So they don't have good lens selections and they don't have even surprisingly like a 50-1.8, which would be perfect. You can have the 22 and then a 50 and that could cover a lot of your bases. So if you're gonna buy one of these cameras because you own uh, bigger DSLR, bigger Canon cameras, you're gonna have to use that adapter and you're gonna have to use big full frame or APS-C lenses, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a small mirrorless camera that doesn't need that extra uh, sensor depth to, you know, to have the adapted lenses. So this is, I think, the biggest disappointment because if you look at Panasonic, they have Panasonic Micro Four Thirds lenses, they have Olympus lenses that you can use with autofocusing. There's a huge selection, and even though Sony doesn't have a great amount of lenses, they still have way more uh, than what Canon is doing. So Canon is just putting out these new cameras, not focusing on lenses, and that really, really sucks. Now I think the biggest reason not to buy this EOS M5 is that lack of lenses, but in addition to that, also the competition, it's just so difficult at that price point, $1,100, uh, to compete. The, for example, the G85, this camera here, you can get it for $100 less, and that includes a really nice 12 to 60 lens. Now that equates to about a 24 to 120 in full frame field of view, compared to uh, something like a 24 um, to about 65, 70-ish, something like that lens on here. And so it's still not a fast lens, but you have a huge range built in. And you can also make use of that dual IS, 
the lens stabilization with the IBIS inside, which the EOS M5 does not have for incredible low shutter speeds and great handheld video. And on top of that, you have uh, the 4K that records, uh, the 1080p that looks good, just a lot more options on the video site as well. And that's $1,000 less. Uh, um, along with that, you can get an A6300 with a kit lens for about $50 less. And uh, with that kit lens, you're what are you getting? Well, you're getting a better sensor, you're getting better low light, better dynamic range, you're getting 4K, you're getting the S-Log, 1080p at 120 FPS. Uh, just in general, a lot nicer specs. And you could still connect, like using a Sigma adapter like I'm shooting with right now, you can connect um, all your Canon lenses to it and it autofocuses quite fast. And the video focusing is, is decent, not amazing, but it's pretty good. And you'll still have a better lens selection. And for a little more money, you can get a 6500 like I'm shooting on and also get really amazing buffer performance and get the IBIS that's built into there, the touchscreen. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, good low price options. And another one is the brand new Fuji X-T20, which I hope to get in for review. And that's basically like the baby brother of the X-T20. T2 and it's a little bit smaller size wise it's fairly similar to this it also does have a touchscreen uh, which is nice you have 4k and you have a huge selection of lenses that are really nice and sharp um, compared to you know this lineup here and you also get really nice the film simulations for jpegs great autofocusing performance, um, and that is less expensive as well. You can either get it for $100 less with a similar kit lens like this one, or for $100 more, you could get their really nice 18 to 55 f2.8 to f4. So it's quite a bit faster, a, st or a stop to just over stop faster, which is nice for low light and better sensor performance at the same time. So it just makes it hard to recommend this EOS M5 when the video features are lackluster, even though usability is pretty good, and the lens selection is very minimal, and the pricing on the camera system is also quite high compared to the competition. So I think the biggest purchasers of this camera are going to be people who are uh, professionals or advanced hobbyists, and they want a smaller body compared to their 5D Mark III, 5D Mark IV, um, or maybe even something like a 7D, uh, but they still want to use their professional larger size lenses on a camera like this. Uh, I think that's kind of the main people that are going to focus on it, and other people that just might know the Canon brand, people that are not really aware of cameras, just getting into it might pick it up as well. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be a very big seller. And if you want to buy one, you might wait for a few months maybe where it's going to drop from 1100 to maybe something more reasonable, 800, 700, maybe even 600 like we've seen uh, in the past where the cameras are not selling well and Canon just dumps the, the price on them so low. And that's where it kind of becomes a little bit more worth it where like I picked this camera up uh, for about half the price of it as it was, you know, maybe six months after it came out. So overall, it's not a horrible camera. On the still side, it's better, but there's just so much downsides to it and then such high price that they're asking for it. And now that we have really good fast adapters, so you can use your Canon glass on here. So if you're willing to use an adapter, you can move to a different brand as well and enjoy uh, extra features and lower price points. So let me know what you guys thought of this uh, video review. Once again, sorry that I was not able to get um, the sample footage and videos. I shot a bunch of stuff, shot some vlog footage too uh, with more examples. Um, so hopefully that will not happen in the future. That's one bad thing about keeping everything on one card. It's nice to organize it so you have everything when I'm ready to do a sit down review um, to have everything there. But a bad thing is if you lose that one card, well, you kind of lose all your data. So back your stuff up. So if you guys have any comments or questions, I'd love to hear you guys' opinions in the comment section below. Once again, I'm gonna have links to uh, this camera and the alternatives that I talked about that I think are a better value in the video description below. And if you guys wanna support us on Patreon for a few bucks a month and get extra perks, we definitely appreciate that. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button so you guys don't miss out on this uh, really nice Olympus camera, the full review, which is gonna include photos and video samples and all that sort of good stuff that we should have. So don't miss that out. Uh, hit that subscribe button and enable notifications, and I'll see you on the next video.